Good morning, church. My name is Arthur. I serve here on the production team, and I'm here to give our teaching text this morning. It comes from Matthew 23, verse 27, through chapter 24, verse 2. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. We are closing out our series uh, on Jesus' woes to the Pharisees. And today is Palm Sunday, and this is the entrance into Holy Week. And what I want to do, uh, which is a little bit different than normal talk, today is going to feel more like a history lecture than it is a traditional sermon. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pay attention and to follow along closely. I don't want you getting lost somewhere in the intertestamental period and spending 15 minutes trying to figure out where we are, okay? I also think it's important to understand the historical dynamic of these things because so often our version of faith is extracted from its cultural context. We basically make it about me, God, and the life I'm trying to live. And that very, very privatized view of faith often stops us encountering the fullness of the kingdom of God that Jesus is trying to establish in the world. So pay attention today, lean in, and I think that by the end of this, you're going to come away with a richer sense of what exactly it was that Jesus was doing and how extraordinary the events of Holy Week are. Now, this sermon begins with Jesus saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And this is Jesus. There's only a few places in the Scriptures, and it's whenever Jesus is trying to make a very, very heavy point. Simon, Simon. Martha, Martha. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. What comes next is a teaching of profound importance, and Jesus opens by, by talking about Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is one of the most extraordinary cities in all of human history. To explain human history requires an understanding of the role of Jerusalem, not just in the ancient Near East, but even in our modern world today. What comes into your mind when you see a picture of Jerusalem, even this one from the air? It just sort of stirs something in your heart. If you were to go to Jerusalem and you were to walk around, you'd be struck by how old and how sacred, but also how contested this city is, even in the modern world. I had the privilege of going there. Here's a picture I took On the Temple Mount, this is the Dome of the Rock. And then next slide here, I got a tour of the Temple Mount, uh, the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque. And under the Dome of the Rock, there's a cave that goes down. And in the cave, there's these copies of the Quran sitting down to you. And when you're in that place, it's like they've dug into almost like the navel of the world. And then you come out of this and then you go down to what is called the Wailing Wall, And it's just two different visions of the same city. There's the Muslim version of the city and the vision of what it means as a holy city for them. And then the Jewish vision of what this means. And then you throw into this some end time evangelical Christians walking around. And I'm just telling you, this city, even to this day, is one of those places that is very, very contested space. And I want us to, I I only say that because even when you see it today, how tense it is, at the time of Jesus, it may have been more tense, more contested, more filled with claims and counterclaims and power dynamics. And this is the city that Jesus is going to step into. Now, by way of reminder, as we head into Holy Week and we come out of Matthew 23, we start moving into the events of the end of Jesus' life. You're going to remember that Jesus' woes to the Pharisees are his final warning and confrontation to the false teachers. 
Okay, so the religious leaders, the teachers of the Lord, Jesus has had multiple interactions with them over the course of his ministry. 33% approximately of the ministry of Jesus was spent debating, responding, or interacting with the Pharisees. And now at the end of all of his warnings about the way they have mishandled covenant life with God, Jesus announces these woes on them. What Jesus is saying is the window of mercy is closing and the judgment of God is is on its way. And this is all getting ready. This is all getting teed up around the celebration of the Passover. Now, the Passover was one of the large festivals in the life of God's people. And people would come, Jewish people would come from all around the world into the city. The city would swell multiple times its size with pilgrims from all over the world who were getting ready to celebrate the Passover. Now, you remember that the Passover was a very, very subversive story for oppressive regimes. It's rooted in the story of Pharaoh who's oppressing the people of God. They're in slavery building his empire. And then God raises up Moses, a deliverer, and God, using Moses, judges the Egyptian gods. Ten plagues come through, and ultimately they're led out into the promised land, into their destiny by the power of God. Now, I want you to think about what's happening in the city of Jerusalem at this time. You've got the Romans who are occupying Jerusalem. And the Romans believe that they are a part of of the destiny of the gods to rule the world. And they're very good at ruling the world. And then here they are in control of this city. And then all of a sudden, here come Jews from all over the world to celebrate the story of a God who overthrows people, who oppresses people. And you can imagine how frustrated they would be and how much joy and hope and expectation and angst there would be in the Jewish people. Dear God, raise up another leader to get rid of the Romans that we may be free again. So you've got these giant cultural dynamics that are happening. So here's what the Romans would do. The Romans, who were no fools, whenever this festival would be celebrated, would bring in a Roman legion. And the legion would march in, in full Roman regalia with the, the, uh, the banners and all the symbolism of Caesar being Lord. And they would march into the city of Jerusalem during what we call Holy Week, the week of the Passover, and take their place in the fortress of Antonius, which Herod had built in order to just sort of like have a space to control the dynamics of the city. And they would come in and they they would say, the ground would almost shake during this parade. And this parade was designed to do one thing to the Jewish people. And here's what it was designed to do. Ready? Don't get any ideas. This is the parade that's coming into the city of Jerusalem. And people would, have, people would have been terrified. The Romans were killing machines, organized, disciplined, potent, and they come down into the middle of the holy city. So when we talk about the triumphal procession and Palm Sunday, what's actually happening is Jesus is offering a counter procession to the actual procession that the Romans are doing as an act of prophetic prophetic uh, subversion to remind people that there is another way than the way of Rome into the city of Jerusalem that God has not given up on his people. Now, I want you to imagine standing in the middle of that city and then hearing the ground begin to shake and and pottery and just a little bit of rattling in the cupboards and you look up and here comes a straight up Roman legion into the city going into the fortress. And then all of a sudden you start hearing people saying, Hosanna, I got photos of this. Well, they're not photos as such. Let's get the legion up. That's Jesus. Here's the legion. I want you to just imagine like just the weight of Rome coming in. Everything it symbolizes, its history, its military might, its empire. That's coming into the city. And on the other side, what do you hear? Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Hosanna, this is your boy Jesus on a donkey coming in. So if you are sitting here and you're watching Rome come in and then you're watching Jesus come in on a donkey, Jesus is from about 100 miles north. 
And Jesus has spent the majority of his ministry, not with cultural elites in Jerusalem, but with peasants and farmers and workers out in these small villages. And now this counter procession, this peasant procession of poor, untrained people coming into the city. This is going to be a showdown of the powers on Holy Week. Now, this counter procession, which is recorded in Zechariah 9, where they're talking about, Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, yet he's humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey. He's caught. Jesus is telling them there's another king, there's another way that is not the way of the world, it is the way of Yahweh. This is the message he's bringing in. And Jesus is coming in that spirit of David. Jesus is coming as a good king into the city. And the reason Jesus is coming into the city, because the city itself has been corrupted. The city itself has failed to live up to its purpose. God had always wanted a city to be an alternative city to the empires of the world. He always wanted a place where his name would be honored, a place where his presence would dwell, a place where the wisdom of God could disciple the war out of the nations, where prosperity could exist. It would be a city on a hill. This was God's vision. And so when King David ultimately established Jerusalem, it was a place of prosperity and it was a place of protection for the people and it was a place of the presence of God. And so under King Solomon, Solomon is the one who goes and builds the temple. Jerusalem is sort of at its peak as a city. Solomon builds this temple, and it's a a breathtaking architectural achievement. Glorious and splendid. And you remember when he dedicates the temple, what happens? The presence of God comes down with such power that the priests can't fulfill their duties. That's a good day in church, by the way, okay? They can't, the presence is so thick, they can't minister to the presence of the Lord. And then it's this, it's this place where God gives his covenant promise, if my people who are called by my name. And so God's establishing a covenant with his people, with a place. And he says that even if you were sent into exile to the ends of the earth and you call on my name and repent, I will bring you back and I will honor my name in this city and this will be a place for me. And so God's heart was always that this is what would happen. And that's why when you read the book of Psalms, Psalm 120 through 34, what's called the songs of ascent or the Psalms of pilgrimage, they say things like this. I was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. They had a vision of wherever they were coming to Jerusalem and beholding God in the beauty of his temple. It was a place where they could encounter covenants. So to be in Jerusalem as a Jewish person, to be ceremonially clean, to stand in the presence of your God manifesting his presence on earth was to literally be caught up in a portal between heaven and earth. This was God's heart. This was his purpose for establishing the city. God's desire was to create a distinct place on earth that did not embody the dynamics of other societies and cultures. And historians call the nature of these other societies and cultures domination systems. So Jerusalem was supposed to be a a place centered on the presence of God, prosperity for everybody, and justice for God's people. And in contrast to the domination systems, which are defined by three things. Number one, political oppression. Number two, economic exploitation. And number three, religious corruption. And so the political oppression, a group of elites would find a way where instead of things trickling down, everything trickled up to those who had political power. And they found a way to manipulate the economy so very few had the the assets of the majority. And then this was baptized with religious imagery and story, justifying what was happening as the will of God. And so this was happening all around the children of Israel. And God said to them, do not take on the idolatrous practices of of your neighbors. There was supposed to be a distinct place. But time and time again, the children of Israel disobeyed God's covenant and chose the way of domination as opposed to the way of justice and faithfulness to God. Solomon started up laying things, chariots, military, taxing the people, a number of wives. In essence, he started to imitate the behavior of Pharaoh in uh, in Jerusalem. After his death, The nation is split in two, the northern northern Israel, southern Israel, 
and the capital of Jerusalem is in southern Israel. And then what God begins to do is to send prophets to call his people back to faithfulness to Yahweh and to warn them of incoming judgment if they violate, continue to violate the covenants of God and to ignore his prophets, which Susie talked about last week. And so God would bring these very strong prophetic critiques to the city of Jerusalem. Here's a couple of them, Micah 1.5. Why is this happening? Because of the sins and rebellion of Israel and Judah. Who's to blame for Israel's rebellion? Samaria, its capital city. And listen to this. Where is the center of idolatry in Judah? In Jerusalem, its capital. He indicts the leaders and the structures of the city for becoming corrupt. Micah 3 goes on. Listen to me, you leaders of Israel. You hate justice and twist all that is right. You are building Jerusalem on a foundation of murder and corruption. Your rulers govern for the bribes you can get. Your priests teach God's law only for a price. Your prophets won't prophesy unless they're paid. Yet all of you claim you are depending on the Lord. No harm can come to us, you say, for the Lord is here among us. So now they're living with deception. You've got a religious system that is corrupt, but they're under a delusion that no harm will ever befall them because they're using the name of God. Isaiah 1 goes on, see how Jerusalem, once so faithful, has become a prostitute. These are heavy words from God, okay? Once faithful has become a prostitute, once the home of justice and righteousness, she's now filled with murderers. Once like pure silver, you've become like a worthless slag, New Living Translation. Once so pure, you are now like watered down wine. Your leaders are rebels, the companions of thieves. All of them take bribes and refuse to defend the orphans and the widows. And just to round it out with some more prophetic judgment, Jeremiah 5 verse 1. Run up and down every street. Where? In Jerusalem, says the Lord. Look high and low. Search throughout the city. If you can find even one person who is just and honest, I will not destroy the city. Even when they're under oath saying, as surely as the Lord lives, they all tell lies. And so you can see that God, over the course of time, has said, do not let this city, this priesthood, my leaders, and your system be corrupted like the world around you. You're meant to be a city on a hill. You're meant to be distinct. And that's why there's this great expectation, there's this conflict, when you've got the way of the world coming down one side, and you've got Jesus coming as a messianic king down the other side, you are about to see a clash of kingdoms. And God is appealing to his people, repent of your ungodly practices, repent of your distorted religion, repent of your compromise with the way of the world and be faithful to me. Pick your parade, but do not pick the way of the world. Now, before Jesus shows up, the city of Jerusalem has had these these dynamics in place that are important to understand what was happening in terms of the religious leaders, not just the Roman Empire, but the religious leaders who were a part of it and how it was built. 586 BC, the Babylonians destroy the city and the temple. Leaders are taken into exile. God's people are removed from the land. It looked like the end for them. They they, They had prophetic words that God would bring them back. But it just felt like forever for them. And they still long for Jerusalem. So in Psalm 137, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. They were like, oh, we long to be back in right standing with God in a place of prosperity, a land of justice, a land of faithfulness. After decades in exile, they were permitted to return. They eventually rebuild the temple. But it is so poor and is is in such such a second-class temple compared to the glory of what Solomon built, that some of the people who remembered the former ones sat there weeping when they saw the temple that was built then. And for several centuries, Judea, with its capital in Jerusalem, was ruled by a series of foreign leaders who came in. And it's like the children of God are hovering between faithfulness and unfaithfulness while empire after empire rises and falls over the course of history. 
under the Persian empires and ultimately its Hellenistic successors. The temple was simply the center of local government. The high priest and the temple ruled the people, except for the most part, they didn't do it in faithfulness to God. There was a sense of religious compromise with those who were around them. <clears throat> Alexander the Great comes along, conquers the known world. After his death, it is split up between his generals, and a very ungodly, anti-Jewish leader ends up taking the area that the Jewish community live in. His name's Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, and he comes to the temple, and he, he commands one of the priests to sacrifice a pig in the temple. And this is just like utter desecration of God's covenant. And so a family rise up, the Maccabeans, ultimately led by Judas Maccabeus, who was the brave heart of his day. He led a battle, and it was one of, it's called one of the 50 most important turning points in military history. It was Judas Maccabeus' battle to defeat uh, the oppressors who were coming after them. Guerrilla warfare, extremely gifted, felt like the favor of God was on them. They ultimately set up a, year, a reign that lasted about 100 years where the Jewish people are in their land, in the temple. They consecrate the temple again, which is what we still celebrate in the city today as Hanukkah, the miracle of uh, provision and light. And all of this happens and they recover their faithfulness to God. But slowly over the course of time, they begin to compromise again. And at this point, another empire rises and enroll the Romans in 63 BC. After abolishing the Jewish monarchy when they arrive, they initially set up a high priest rule and a local aristocracy sort of oversees the details that are happening. And the Romans had a policy. It was this, as long as you pay us taxes, don't call up and cause us problems and are loyal to Caesar, you do you. So it's like you do you, heavily taxed with loyalty to our leader, but you do you. And so this is the situation they find themselves in. And the Jews had this stubborn conviction based on the promises of God's word that this was not the way that God intended them to live in the world. And so they were perpetually rising up and causing problems for the leaders who were over them. So eventually, the Romans, in order to put down some of the problems, install a king called Herod, who's half Idumean, which means he's not uh, pure, purely Jewish. And so as a result, nobody considers him totally authentic. And he's put in place... Uh, in the Roman Senate by Caesar Augustus and Mark Antony. There's a, an historical account where they leave and he is given the title King of the Jews and he is sent back to rule. Herod was a ruthless ruler as we've talked about before, but he was a brilliant politician and a breathtaking builder. And he began a building co uh, campaign that fundamentally trans transformed the landscape of the time. He established a sort of hodgepodge religious system where instead of there being legitimate high priests, he would put in people who were loyal to him. So one of the things he did when he first came to power is he found all the faithful Jewish leaders, killed them all, took their wealth and their property, and then gave it to people who would be loyal to him. So he established an inner circle that was unjust, built on compromise, and in some sense inherited the blood and cries of God's faithful people. These were the people who were around him. And in order to make peace, he did one thing that appeased the majority of the people, is he built a temple. Some scholars say it took just over 46 years to build, and it was so beautiful, it was considered one of the most beautiful buildings in the world at the time. People would see it from the distance, and the sun would glisten off us, and people would be moved to tears. A breathtaking building. He also built a temple called Antonius with fountains, pools, gold ceilings, chains of silver and gold inlaid with jewels of the most expensive kind, mosaic floors. His dining room had enough seating for 300 guests. Now, this is at a time of great poverty. This is a time when people were struggling mightily because their taxation rates were out of control, almost as bad as Canada. Taxation rates, unbelievably out of control. He builds a hippodrome in Jericho. And the way that he does all of these building projects is by taxing the people, taxing the people. And so if you were a part of the peasant class, day laborers, farmers, fishermen, you felt the weight, not just of Rome, but of Herod. And then the religious system that required taxes for the temple, all of this was pressing down on you. And so when Jesus shows up in the poor parts 
of the country. And when he talks about a kingdom coming, when he teaches the blessedness of the Beatitudes, when he talks about a God who has anointed him to break off oppression and to bind up wounds and to bring hope to the poor, people started to believe maybe a Messiah is coming along, a Messiah like David again. When Herod dies, people see an opportunity, and they basically say this, do not give the future of our region to Herod's sons, who will just continue this oppression and brutality. And so upon his death, disputes break out where they try and throw off both the weight of Rome and the weight of Herod. In one village called uh, Sepphoris, not far from where Jesus grew up, 4,000 Jewish men were crucified around that village as they tried to rebel against Rome. In the city of Jerusalem, a group of people rose up. They tried to take the temple back from the corruption of Herod. And 2,000 Jewish men were crucified around the temple in Jerusalem as a warning, do not mess with the Romans who are in power. So this is happening in the conscious memory of Jesus and his community. So it wasn't just like Jesus was out one day living in obscurity, has a chat with his father, is baptized, and is like, I've got a message of peace for everybody. Jesus is stepping into profoundly political, economic, socioeconomic disputes and conflict and oppression and pressure. And here he comes. One prayer's coming in this way, and Jesus is coming in the other way, and Jesus is talking about faithfulness to God, another kingdom, and a different kind of leadership. What's ended up happening at the time of Jesus? Once again, and this is why it's coming in the prophetic tradition, is God is saying, Jerusalem has been corrupted. You're oppressing the poor. You don't care about justice. You're distorting religion so it doesn't look like Yahweh intended. You've compromised with the powers who are above you, and you're living off this broken system to prosper yourself and Jerusalem looks nothing like God wants it to. And this is why what Jesus does <clears throat> is extraordinary. This is why when Jesus comes along and he says things, or when John the Baptist starts calling people to be baptized out in the wilderness, he's not calling them to be baptized at the center of religion. He's saying, come out from the religious corruption and start again in the prophetic tradition. When Jesus forgives sins, the reason this is so controversy, controversial is because to have your sins forgiven, you had to go to the temple and the high priest and the day of atonement. And there was a whole system to have your sins forgiven. But Jesus is saying, I'm here. That system's going to become unnecessary. When Jesus talks about worship with the woman at the well, he says the, the, the day is coming where it won't be Jerusalem and it won't be here. Worship's going to happen in spirit and in truth. Jesus takes all the symbolism and expectation and recenters it, not in the broken, unjust, corrupt, religious, political system of his day. He centers it in himself. And this is why Jesus is considered a threat. Look at what it says in John chapter 11. This is the leaders having a discussion about Jesus. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So what is Jesus? So it's the religious leaders having a conversation about how Jesus is destabilizing the unjust religious system. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than the whole nation should perish. He did not say this out of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And so between 6 AD and 70 AD, there were 18 high priests, and a high priest was appointed to be the priest for life. And you can see how the political turmoil, putting people out, putting people in. But Caiaphas did a reasonably good job and got an 18-year run in, prophesying this at the time of Jesus. And so you can see how when Jesus is in the city, and he's coming as a prophet. And you can see how there's two parades coming in. And you can see the history of all of Jesus' ministry. And you can see the expectations of Passover. You can see how the events of Holy Week are a politically, religiously, prophetically charged environment. And then Jesus comes into the city. And this is what we're reading after his confrontation with the religious leaders. And Luke's gospel records it like this. And when he drew near and he saw the city... He wept over it, 
saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that made for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they'll not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and he began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Now remember, a den of robbers... A den is not where people rob. A den is where you go to hide after you have robbed. And Jesus is now saying, you've made the temple the place where you're hiding out because of your corrupt practices. And he entered the temple and began to drive out. It's meant to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for the people were hanging on his words. Two parades, two systems, two leaders, one choice. And here's what God is saying to his people in these passages. Do not give in to the way of the world. Do not compromise the covenant with Yahweh. Do not make this religion about yourself. Remember why I have called you to be a city on a hill, a different vision of what life is like under God. And yet here you are siding with the Romans rather than with the prophets of God. And Jesus, in essence, is is sad and he's weeping because they are resisting mercy. There is a window for repentance and deliverance and it is closing And as it closes, Jesus weeps over the city. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple, was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. What a, what a, thank you for coming to church. It's about to get worse. What a tragedy. There's two things I want you to see here. There's not two. I'm not going to limit myself to two. There's a few things I want you to see here. Number one, God's heart to show mercy on his people in the midst of their unfaithfulness and their rebellion. Jerusalem, I long, I long to have mercy on you, but you would have none of it. I want you to see this. The majority of the judgment you're going to see that happens here is not God judging his people. It's God withdrawing his protection so they can be under the judgment of the world. There's, two, there's multiple times, kinds of wrath in the Bible. There's the active wrath of God, but the worst kind is the passive wrath of God where he says, if you don't want me, I'm going to let you opt in to the way of the world and then you won't have my mercy in the world. All you're going to have is the power of empire and oppression. So he's, he's saying, come to me. Let me show you mercy. And they say, I don't want any of it. Don't resist mercy. Number two, don't deceive yourselves to think that there will not be consequences for resisting the mercy of God. Don't, the Bible says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap destruction. And so God is saying, don't think that you're going to be fine. Don't think you can change your framework, your sociology, your convictions, and your soul prosper. You cannot change the state of your soul before God simply because you change your worldview. And so Jesus is saying, do not think that you can avoid the discipline and judgment of God if you do not receive his mercy. And this is a profound reminder of this. And it also lets us know the real world consequences 
of the way of Jesus in the world versus the way of empire. We are not here with privatized faith, talking about going to a spiritual, ethereal world when we are dead. Jesus didn't die so that your soul could go some other place later on. Jesus' primary message was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And his goal is to bring his kingdom into the world and that the rule and reign of Jesus would overcome the systems of oppression in the world and the world would look more like God wants it to be than the brokenness of sin. But you would have none of it, he says. And so Jesus goes to the cross, rises from the dead, and then his followers, for the most part, obey him and go out into all the world. And while they're making disciples and while you're reading the book of Acts and you're seeing the kingdom of God spread through the world, the majority of the people who rejected Jesus, that corrupt political system, the city of Jerusalem, stays there and gets worse and worse and worse. In 66 AD, a Roman ruler named Gessius Florus is put over the region to manage the Jewish community, and he hates them. He tries to collect, in 66 AD, overdue taxes from the Jews by ordering 17 talents to be taken from the temple treasury in Jerusalem and given to Caesar. In reply, some younger and bolder, uh, some young Jewish men walk around the city mocking the Roman ruler by carrying an empty basket, going amongst the poor, begging if there's spare change for the bankrupt rulers of Rome. This led to the leader marching to Jerusalem, taking up residence in Herod's palace, and demanding the Jewish leaders deliver up the young men who insulted Rome this way. The Sanhedrin said it was impossible to hand them over, so Florus responded by unleashing the troops under his command and ordering to the, to them to plunder the southwest quarter of the city and massacre anybody they found in this part of the city. AD 66, this begins what will be a devastating rule of judgment on the city of Jerusalem. The temple itself is filled with blood. This would have been a signal for the Christians to flee. And historians tell us that the majority of the Christian community left Jerusalem in 66 AD, taking Jesus' word seriously that he prophesies in the book of Matthew. And then ultimately, the city itself, once they deal with some of the Romans, will break into a kind of civil war. Jerusalem has three distinct warring parties happening in the midst of it. And they seize different parts of the city. And one group captures the temple and kills all the priests serving in duty in the temple. And then that, that, is, that is the beginning of the end. Vespasian ultimately comes in and begins to rage a war to put down this rebellion against Rome, making tremendous progress. But ultimately, when Nero commits suicide, he is brought back to become emperor in 70 AD. He sends his son Titus to come in. And in the spring of AD 70, he marches across the Judean border, surrounds the city, and begins a siege that will have devastating effects. He builds siege ramps, battering ramps, and slowly over the course of several months, breaks down two of the city's walls. The Judeans fought off the Romans several times, deceiving themselves into thinking they would be able to deliver themselves. But however, after months of famine, the city begins to descend in ultimately to a place of chaos. Starvation goes on. There's one horrific account of a mother eating her child because she's so delusional in starvation. And then ultimately, Titus is able to penetrate the walls of the temple and to break in, and a wholesale massacre breaks out in the city of Jerusalem. The Romans give, this is one historian, the Romans give full vent to their rage and frustration. While the temple is burning, Josephus records that looting went on right and left and anyone who was caught was put to the sword. There was no pity for age, regard for rank, little children, old men, laymen, priests alike were ultimately butchered. And Titus, in order to establish the destruction of Jerusalem and the triumph of Rome, sacrifices an ox, a sheep, and a pig, and then raises the Roman legion standards of the emperor to desecrate the temple. Josephus will report that 97,000 prisoners of war will be taken during the Judean campaign, 
and approximately a million people will die during the siege itself. Vespasian, in order to honor Titus, brings him back to Rome and he receives an official triumph. If you go to Rome today, you can, you can visit this. It's a, uh, you have to pay to get into it now. When I first went there, it was free. But, you know, inflation. So now you go in and, and you can go and see Titus's triumph arch. And on the inside of it, next slide here, on the inside of it, this is the sign of the temple instruments, including the menorah, being carried out and being brought back into the city of Rome. Two of the Jewish leaders of the resistance were brought back to Rome along with 700 leading men. John and Simon were paraded through the streets of Rome in the wake of Titus's chariot. Once the exhibition concluded, John was somehow surprisingly only sentenced to life imprisonment and not put to death. But Simon, when he arrived at the temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill, was dragged across the forum, scourged by metal barbed whips that tore flesh from his body, and then he was slowly suffocated in front of the people while they cheered and offered universal applause to Caesar and to Rome. And this is how Josephus puts it, and so ended the first Jewish revolt against Rome. The city was renamed by the Romans, Alia Capitolina. It was a fully Hellenized city, and Jews were banned from living in it. 60,000 Jews were taken into slavery, and in 72 AD, they were used to build this. Next slide here. The Colosseum. Vespasian had inherited a throne that was like pretty unstable, and he wanted to do something to make the people like him. So using 60,000 Jewish slaves and the gold that was plundered from the temple, he funded and built the Colosseum in Rome. This is the end of God's judgment prophesied by Jesus. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I'm sending you prophets, but all you do is kill them. Religious leaders, I am calling you back to covenant faithfulness, but you won't have any of it. You are choosing to partner with Rome and crucify your Messiah, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. God longed to show them mercy. But when they chose to align themselves with the parade of Rome rather than the parade of Jesus, their fate was set. And this was the result. And so this makes me pause for a minute and just say, what is God's intent for the church. God's intent under the lordship of Jesus, the Messiah, is that the church would be an alternative system of life in the midst of the world. It would be a place where justice is taught. It would be a place where integrity is modeled. It would be a place where people come and they thrive and they find life. You are not called to a personal relationship that you may live your best life and go somewhere when you die. You are here to model the good news of life under the lordship of the true Messiah as the people of God filled with the Holy Spirit, modeling how beautiful life with God could be. And I don't know about you, but when I hear Jesus' woes to the Pharisees, I get the fear of God in my soul because we live at a moment right now in the Western church where God is going through his church and he is disciplining out worldliness and immorality and oppression from his church. You look at some of these religious brands or religious leaders and you're like, surely their ministry will last forever. But God is not committed to ministry brands and leaders. God is committed to holiness and to integrity and to faithfulness. And anybody who steps out of the way of Jesus will deal with the consequences of the world. This is a reminder for us as we head into Holy Week to choose carefully which parade that we will align with. It's a reminder to be loyal to God. It's a reminder that God's heart is always for mercy. The question is, are we willing to receive it? Will we be stubborn, blind, heart of heart? Or will we be tender and responsive and receive the mercy of God? Our team has written a song just as a, a way of sort of processing and reflecting on the things we've heard over the last two months. So why don't you just, just open your heart 
Why don't you just respond and say, Lord, if there's anything in me that is caught up in the way of the world that's not loyal to you, Lord, I see that you have opened up a window of mercy and I'm saying, I want it. I want your mercy. Maybe you're here today and there's something in your life and you've, you've deceived yourself into thinking because you've got away with it this far, you'll always get away with it. I don't know what it is, but let's not, after having heard two months of really heavy warnings from Jesus, just move on with our lives like God has not spoken. So let's create some space and reflect during this song.